So, uh, the, the topic is art about animals, and you know, there's a very short list which uh, Allison had started to put together for us a few weeks ago of books that movies that explicitly address our very problematic relationship with animals. And um, I mean, they're, they're interesting, but I think for a lot of us, these are over familiar these examples. And uh, the list will grow, but I think in the meantime, there's a far larger and maybe more interesting list, at least for people who like to dig in um, in their analysis. And that's all the works that unintentionally address this relationship between humans and the other animals. And arguably, that's, that's every <laughs> text, right? Mm -hmm. That's every, well, I think any, any piece of art that's rich and meaningful will address our situation in some, not total sense, but some approaching total. And um, if, if our relationship with the animals is, surprise, surprise, fundamental, then um, th there will be signs of that relationship that are worth exploring in, in every text, I think. And this is, this is an idea quite familiar to, to most schools of sort of deep critique, deep theory. I mean, um, there are very few texts prior to, say, 1800, we could call feminist. <laughs> but every feminist knows every text in the history of text is amenable to a feminist analysis, right? It will bear signs um, patriarchy. Every text under patriarchy uh, is a document of life under patriarchy, if we can, if we can decode it. So this is the same for, um, I think, for our relationship with animals, which is at, at least as to debate about what's fundamental. <laughs> what's fundamentaler than other, but you know, this is, this is a core relationship. We, uh, you know, civilization uh, begins, begins with animal agriculture, arguably. It's, civilization is founded on the mass domination of these animals. You're, you're basically saying that, that, uh, that every text uh, has, a, has implications, uh, has like animalist implications in a society that is founded on, upon the domination of animals and nature, like society exactly. has been founded upon the domination sure. of women. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it doesn't mean that every text will have a pro-animal message, right? I mean, a feminist would look at the book of Revelation and say, okay, not a feminist text, arguably misogynist in places, but um, very, in, you know, especially interesting because of its misogyny. Yes. To, yes, to yes feminist absolutely. analysis. And so, I mean, we'll find that some texts inadvertently um, have a pro-animal or animalist consciousness in them. Um, and many will just reflect the, the conditions and, 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 and uh, you know, euphemize the, the, the oppressive relationship between human and animals. So, you know, art, remember that, I hate to do the numbers thing too much, but, you know, our very few billion thrive on, we metabolize, literally, the, the bodies of trillions of animals in a very physicalist sense. Our civilization rides on their energy. And I don't think you need a Marxian kind of structure, superstructure materialism to, to suspect that that will bear traces in, in, in the culture. So you've got to archeologically find, find the signs of that, that truth. This is, this is a truth that can't be suppressed. Blood will out. If not in conscious confession, then in dreams and deferrals, in obscure codes, and in art, certainly, where we sort of dream out loud, right? So I think good art is a little bit unconscious. It's like a good dream. dream. We're, we're most creative when we're dreaming. And a good artist taps into a force, into a creative wellspring, and draws on that. And they, they go with their instinct, meaning they say, like Kubrick will say at Take 98, that's the one. Because what, what? Because it's interesting. And he doesn't have to give you an essay on why it's interesting. He just knows that that's the interesting one. He's usually right, perhaps. But um, um, unconsciously, this, this truth, this blood will, will out. Oh, yes. <laughs> Start with some easy ones, maybe. This, you know, this code is not particularly obscure, especially if the movie is about food. If the movie's about food, the movie's about some crisis in our system of food, and if the revelation at the heart of the movie is, is of some violent reality, which our feeding is structured upon, 
then it's going to be pretty easy to find the animal in all of this, or to find the animal analog at least. So Soylent Green, in fact, is people. <laughs> We're, Soylent Green is people, so this is you know, the famous, famous reveal. Yeah, yeah. Soylent Green is people, well that means with a little bit of broadening by translation that we're eating our own kind, right? That's the horror of it. The horror is we're eating our own kind. <laughs> and so what is our own kind? Well, that depends. That depends on how far your circle of inclusiveness yeah. has gone, right? So uh, we could say maybe we animals. We're eating. We already know this, we say to some degree. We say this is not news. This is not a revelation. This is just what's going on every day. We're eating our own kind. Um, in fact, perhaps texts which haven't at least half consciously addressed this metabolizing become a little bit ludicrous, right? Where um, they're presenting what, what's supposed to be a horrific revelation that's news to the audience. And, you know, people who've extended their consciousness a little bit to include more beings can say, this is, this is old news, this is not surprising. So fiction begins with a kind of imagine if. Imagine if a family of cannibals butchered wayward travelers. So the horror, when it's done to us, is a, is a what if. Though in this case, it's, uh, you know, they say at the beginning, based on actual events. Um, it already is for the animals. So uh, we could we could say the human victim here, from an animalist perspective, the human victim here is some kind of fully anthropomorphized animal. And to sympathize with the abattoir animal, it's as if a very morally obtuse audience needs to see a human <laughs> taken through the stations of dismemberment and consumption. I know uh, Will Tuttle argues, he, it's kind of an aside comment in the world peace diet, he says, he serves in the speculative mode, he says maybe a lot of horror, like the, the genre horror is uh, us encountering in a different way the horror of what we're doing to the animals. It's so clear in a case like the Texas Chainsaw Mask, it became clear to the director himself, who kind of went vegetarian at least for, for a time after directing. The horror of the Matrix is that we are grown. Our bioenergy is harvested by a massive technologic empire. And the truth of this subjugation is obscured in a virtual reality, in a perfectly ubiquitous ideology. But this again, it's already so, we already know this. Yeah. As long as that we is extended to include the animals. So when you, uh, when you give it this metaphoric extension, when you allow the movie this metaphoric extension, it doesn't have to be into animals, it could be into just technological capitalism or, 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 some, or AI. I guess in AI it's not a metaphor anymore, but uh, if, if you allow it this kind of metaphoric extension, then the film becomes prophecy. Not prophecy in predicting a future, right? Good sci-fi is usually in part about the present. It's, and good prophecy is not just about the future. Prophecy is about archetype time. Prophecy is telling us what is what has always been going on. Yeah. It's like the, the poetry that Ezra Pound says um, gives us the news that stays news. News that stays news. And so truthful news would, would just repeat this revelation. Right? It would like a warning bell. It would say the matrix continues unabated. The headline would say again, we uh, today, like don't, don't we feel truthful headlines would just kind of say today again we killed lots of animals. Should, should three days a week at least the headline be that? We're killing, we're still killing lots of animals. We're still stringing up and eviscerating and decapitating billions of our very close relatives in this planet. We're surrounded by the slaughter's remains. In this case, we're sitting on their skin. On farms and in labs, we are the insentient machine. We appraise with our reductive eye, the herder's eye that Tuttle talks about, the uh, helpless subject. And the empire has its pleasures <laughs> for those who are willing to forget. Yep. Those who disconnect will face some hardship. 
Here you go, buddy. Breakfast. <laughs> Champ is a little bit cut off there, unfortunately. Well, ve vegan fare is supposed to be better than this, but um, this is analog of the, of the suffering of those who disconnect from the matrix, I suppose. Those who oppose empire. <laughs> so any any film about food, any film that begins on a farm should soon reveal the animal. Now by the order of edit, of course, well Star Wars the Saga begins in episode four, so the, you know the, I'm not sure we should go by the order of editing exactly to discern what we call the order of myth. Uh, by the order of myth, Star Wars begins on a farm. A hero with a thousand faces yeah. is pulled off farm from his uneasy peace into the world of quest, into the world of wider conflict. Uncle Owen <laughs> treats the beasts of burden. It's a moisture farm, there are no animals, really. It's a, <laughs> but there are, so we'll find the animal through the beast of burden. Uncle Owen treats them with disdain. He's very uncomfortable with their eruptions of subjectivity. Luke um, treats them as equals. Luke cares for them. He tends to address them as equals. And through his care for R2, right? He's, he's fiddling with R2, fixing him. He cares about um, The quest is revealed. It's through the care for R2. The quest is revealed. The problem at the heart of empire is revealed. And this quest draws Luke and the droids from the farm. It's a quest that leads to the farm's destruction. <laughs> Not intentionally on Luke's part. Luke can hear this message that R2 brings. And what is the message? Who's the bearer of the message? It's this ethereal feminine force. It's a woman in trouble. That's David Lynch's tagline for Inland Empire. When, when fans were asking, what are you working on now? After Mulholland Drive, he said, well, I'm not going to say anything except it's about a woman in trouble. It's his obsession <laughs> for his last few movies, I think. But here we have a woman in trouble. The feminine is in trouble. You know, uh, even if you're uncomfortable with the equation of the feminine and the natural, the fact is R2 uses it. And so for reading that art, we can say that there's some, some connection here between the feminine and the natural. It was pointed out to me, I can't remember by whom. Um, but the natural is also a machine. The natural could... That's right, there's... <laughs> <laughs> the machines are connected to the natural here, too. I'm, I'm trying to make them analog for the natural. Did I just contradict myself? But some, um, there are no women in the evil empire. No women. Yeah. Serving under Darth Vader or the Emperor. Within this droid, trapped within slave economy, is a vital feminine force whose plea is discerned by the one who shows the droid some care. To show the droid care is what releases the awareness of the quest, right? Uh, to, to see the quest is just to listen to, to that feminine plea. I like this quote, and in part because like any good aphorism, you're never quite sure what it means. No heroes, only opportunities. But the way I think of it is, and maybe Thomas can um, fill us in in the Q&A, but the, the way I think of it is, is um, you know, what seems like a heroic act is probably the outcome of a long-term preparation for, for uh, a preparing of the soul and body for that kind of situation. Right? And then the hero says, well, I just did what anyone would have done, but not, not everyone would have done that. Not everyone was prepared to act in that way. And the situation arose. And not everyone will even recognize the situations. Maybe those situations are all around us. This is the inside of the Death Star. This, the, 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 the quests maybe surround you. They're there. The pleas are there if you learn to discern them, if you can um, see through the caricatures that Empire throws over the Subject. So the helpless subject's plea is hidden. There are a lot of people who have that heroic impulse, and they're just waiting for the, you know, the damsel in distress or the cry for help, and they never see it, and they go through life, and they die, and they R.I.P., and they never got to be a hero. But maybe they just didn't learn to hear the cry of the, uh, of the um, helpless subject. So heroism is learning to recognize those opportunities, and then acting on them. And it's hard to recognize. Star Wars begins on a farm, Field of Dreams begins and ends on a farm. There's a quest that takes us off the farm, again, to the wise old man, Terrence Mann. This one uh, begins on a traditional farm and ends on some kind of transfigured farm. It's the uh, 
some vision of the American pastoral kind of agrarian paradise. The uh, <coughs> ghost asks uh, Ray Kinsella, is this heaven? And Ray says, no, it's Iowa. The field of dreams is heaven, but heaven given some kind of geographic specificity. It's the realization of the American dream from a traditional farm. And what kind of farm is it? Well, we, we say reflexively it's a corn farm. It's growing corn, but that's a meat farm, we know. <coughs> Most grain and corn is raised for livestock feed in the late 80s when this movie was made. Over 80% of corn in the U.S. was used to feed to cattle, pigs, chicken. So, so he, this, is, this is on its surface. If you just know the data, this is on its surface, whether the director knew it or not a film about a farm directly complicit with animal subjugation. The animal is just off screen. <laughs> this is Ray wandering in, I think it's the morning after, he first hears the voice. And um, what's the name of the Jimmy Stewart movie with the big rabbit? Harvey? Yeah, Harvey. Harvey. Yeah. yeah, and you know, Harvey. Jimmy Stewart hears his, uh, hearing Harvey or talking about hearing Harvey and we got the cow just off screen. So the, 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 the animal is one plausible answer to whose voice Ray is hearing. We're, we're never told whose voice it is. In fact, even in the credits, if you look, <laughs> it just says uh, the voice and even for played by it just says himself. I'm not even sure how legally they got that in the, the, the credits around the union, but uh, so I'm not even sure whose voice that is, you know, saying if you build it, you will Some kind of, you know, it's a fish out of water story. It's an anomaly in the agrarian. It's at the feed store confessing he's been hearing voices. You're hearing voices, hearing voices, where he's hearing voices. There's Annie confronting the, the Nazi book burner at the PTA meeting, I think it is. Um, Annie comes from a farming family, but she meets Ray at Berkeley. That they go to Berkeley, you know, we get that little montage at the beginning where we. You know, it's, 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 it's a montage of America's, you know, the baby boomers encounter in the 60s. This is not a datum that gives these characters uh, realistic specificity. It's rather a datum that they went to Berkeley and Ray says he majored there in the 60s. This is a datum which is meant to make them carriers of a whole generation's um, ethos. They're types. Here the locals are gawking as Ray and daughter overplow the cornfield. And turn it into something beautiful and useless. So they, you know, they build the ball field and Ray says, it's beautiful, but it's useless. What have I done here? I've created a beautiful thing, but it has no function. It has no, uh, you know, capital transfer. So the ball field is actually built fairly quickly. Thankfully, you know, <laughs> when you get the setup in Field of Dreams and you start to worry, okay, maybe it's going to take them like two and a half hours now to build this ball field and they're going to run into zoning problems. With, and no, the ball field is built, built pretty quickly. And it's, okay, so what's going to happen now? What's the quest? Well, the quest is really of the movie to understand what the ball field is. They built very quickly this beautiful, useless thing and it's there gleaming, glowing in the middle of this farm. And the question then becomes, what is it? What is it we've made? And for that, they have to turn to the voice of the 60s counterculture. This is Terrence Mann. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit ludicrous. We're told he coined the phrase, make love, not war. Again, he's, he's barely a character and more a uh, carrier for 60s counterculture, which was, you know, a confluence of oppositional forces to American empire. And... Um, He's, he's like Ray, a symbol of the counterculture, but he's, a, he's its a visionary. He's the one who's a step ahead and showing the Rays the next step forward. When Ray's researching him in the library, he, he, he finds that uh, Terrence Mann actually drops out of the counterculture that he had helped to foment. Drops out of the 60s in 1969. And what does he do? Well, a couple of years ahead of Greenpeace's confrontation with the Russian whalers, starts writing poetry about whales and stuff. And the way to his apartment in Boston is uh, flanked by old world butcher shops. Ray appears in Boston and he's surrounded by meat. Carcasses are being carried off the truck into this Jewish butcher shop. And everywhere he goes, he's lost among the butcher shops. And finally he wanders to this little gas station and pays the, the 
gas jockey off. He says, first door that don't have a chicken in the window is his. So it's this single blue door surrounded left and right by animal carcasses. He's not a vegetarian. He wasn't intended to be. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, you know, he orders a hot dog at the ballpark. But, <laughs> but uh, symbolically, something's been slipped in here, which is weird. Both farm and daughter are threatened and saved at the same time at the, at the film's close and climax. At the very end, everything comes to a head. The creditors are pushing Ray in the final confrontation, and the child is pushed, you know, inadvertently in the course of that struggle and uh, falls off the bleachers. <coughs> Her near-death experience is woven into the near-death of the farm. She stands for the farm. She's the best of Ray and Annie. She represents the idealism of their union. She and farm are kind of analogs for the other. And with, with, this is a little bit ridiculous, maybe, she's choking on hot dog. The farm, the daughter are choking on meat, literally, and almost die. And they're saved by this act of medical magic. The magic has crossed the baseline, it's become real, and the sleepy pilgrims are already on their way towards this field of dreams. The field of dreams is the farm transfigured. It's good stock, perhaps. Another gathering of energies opposed to American empire. Woodstock was held on a dairy farm, remade, and Max Yasger, the farm owner, uh, like Ray, is ostracized by his neighbors for his defection. Field of Dreams is farm sanctuary. <laughs> what more closely resemble Ray and his foolish dream than a Gene Bauer or a Brenda Bronfen? The world outside the sanctuary gates decimates these animals, breeds them into meat-laden mockeries of life. Within the sanctuary, we restart the relationship and relate really for the first time with these animals in proper mutuality. The field of dreams is a sanctuary. <clears throat> the sanctuary is some kind of ark. The ark is a model of a better world, or it's a blueprint, it's code, it's the code for a better world. It's the seed or the miniature of a better world, which, which arises within the old and dying one. And the world become hostile to life. Both these stories, I think, are incomprehensible without an animal-centered analysis. Of course, if you want a literal reading of Field of Dreams, the, the, the literal is its own kind of absurd. Um, and I say this perhaps defensively, doing these sort of slightly left-of-center readings. Uh, we'll see when we get into The Shining, maybe it gets a little bit weirder even. But, um, um, <laughs> I mean, if you, if you interpret Field of Dreams literally, the movie becomes absurd, and the interpretation becomes a little bit reflectively absurd, right? The, uh, the Cantonese title for Field of Dreams, if you translate it back into English, is um, Imaginary Dead Baseball Players Looking Like Cornfield. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what it's about, but something's been lost. Um, it's not, no, it's not about, that's the last thing it's about. <laughs> right, that's standing for everything else. contact with the animal world by prophecy. In the field of dreams, there's an encounter with the numinous at the end of a world or the birth of a, of a new one. This is field of dreams and this is also the shining. The shining means, the shining is the power of prophecy and it's ambiguous. It's the power that the hotel has. It's the hotel's aura. The spirit realm's power to appear to the prophet and the shining is the prophet's own receptive sensitivity. So the shining is mediumship and the spirit world's own power to shine. The shining is not just about, not just about prophecy. It is prophecy. The shining is itself a revelatory document attending to which we can divine the truth of the moon landing, the Holocaust, native genocide, the founding of America, and the maze and the minutes of this curious Greek myth. 
Shining is a site where the dead and the living meet, where the past makes itself heard to the living present. And the word it brings is unpleasant. It brings the word murder, read first backwards and then forward, famously. Backward first <coughs> into the past, saying, the history of this site is murder. The meaning, the origin of this site you were in is murder. And then forward, uh, a horrific warning, and murder is now upon you. Murder is now returning. So the, the, the red rum murder thing is not just, watch out, Danny, you're, you and your mom are about to be killed. It's murder is the secret origin of this site of prophecy. And so, I think there's a causal. So murder will return. Murder is always happening here. And you, you don't understand this place without understanding the murder that is at its heart. The overlook is built on blood, and blood will out the weighty building, the wallpapers, and uh, the decade renos and discreet service. These are all a structure of suppression. The overlook is a suppression of its murderous uh, essence. Both the Overlook and the Temple of Apollo at Delphi are sites of prophecy set in the mountains. Both, and this is key, both constructed on a culture-founding act of violence. The temple is built over the navel of Gaia. It's built literally on the womb of the Earth Mother. And the Python, whom history's victors tell us was a monster, is her child. Apollo enters the site and slays the python, slays the guardian of Gaia, the child of Gaia, at the center of the world, renames the site, and rises to prominence as uh, the supreme god of light and reason to the Greeks by whose lucid eye nature is comprehended and mastered. The sky god who stands serene and star-like at the apex of technology's trajectory. Again, Kubrick tells us that civilization begins with the murder of an animal. The metabolized animal is here literally, almost, by a huge jump cut, maybe, uh, the energy we ride into heaven on. America, uh, like the Overlook, is built on a massacre the natives. Natives that include hundreds of millions of buffalo, beaver, billions of passenger pigeons, which I, I don't know by Linnaeus if they're doves, but archetypally these are doves. We slaughtered billions, flocks of billions of passenger pigeons within a few decades as food for slaves primarily. And remember that the, the indigenous peoples themselves were slain and eradicated in part, the justification was in part, that they were too close to nature. That they were, they were like the animals. They hadn't, you know, locks formulation, hadn't properly mixed their labor with the land. And so it could be cleared like trees and animals. This is not obscure. The truth of this is plain to see on the American flag. This is, well, the first North American flag, which is a corporate logo, and which is riddled, surrounded by the corpses of all the animals that North America is founded upon. So an elevator brings up. If you watch the uh, floor hands, when the, you know, the, the doors open up and the blood comes out, you, the elevator coming from upstairs or downstairs, and it's not moving. As far as I can tell, the hands aren't moving. But uh, so, I, so I, I um, defer to an etymological explanation. Elevator means to bring up. The elevator is bringing up blood. There's a corpse in the basement, like every haunted house. There's a corpse in the basement, and you can freeze it. You can drain it but the blood will out. The blood is the truth of the situation and it's incorruptible. The 
Delphic Sibyl prophesied by inhaling fumes through a fissure in the temple's foundation. By legend, this was fumes from the rotting corpse of the slain python. Uh, there's a corpse at the core of the Overlook, too. Now, this is not in a basement. This is on, the, I guess, the second floor in room 237, or 221, I think it is, in King's version. There's a murdered woman at the core. Two, you know, two, three, room 237 is at the core of the Overlook. There's a murdered woman there, moldering and rotting. And Jack enters her sight, like an Apollo. He's a writer. He's a writer uh, figure, which is an Apollonian type. And he's surrounded, like the priest, the mediating priest at the Temple of Apollo, he's surrounded by uh, female sibyls or, uh, uh, you know, Danny, he's a child who's not yet disconnected from the feminine. He's, he's close to his mother. So this Apollonian writer type, um, he's a confused Apollonian, I think, and he's not in touch with the voices. He, he hears them, too, like a good prophet, but he's, he, he can't manage them. He's, he never makes friends with them, really. They're always menacing. Well, uh, so Jack enters the lair of this uh, woman who at first is emerging from the bathing water. She's the resplendent feminine. And then she morphs into the cackling caricature, caricature of a witch. This, this scene is, is very, it almost seems heavy-handed when the witch is coming, you know, POV towards the camera. And, and it's, it's horrifying, of course, but one almost laughs and says, this is... I mean, this is just a you know, stock witch character. It's a particularly horrifying example. Oh, this is just a you know, cackling witch. You can almost hear Kubrick off camera saying, no, more like a cackling witch. Just be a cackling witch from children's um, fables. What is the witch? The witch is the empowered feminine that Apollo slew. And it's now awakened. And it's haunting him. It's mocking him. And it's implicating him. I think he's guilty. Implicating him in a crime. <coughs> Sight of at the heart of this place, reminding him of something maybe he already already knows in his nightmares. So I agree with Jay Widener that there's something going on in this film with Apollo 11. That, I mean, he thinks the film is is consciously Kubrick's attempt to code in a message about uh, the moon landings, the Apollo 11 mission. I think there's something going on here with Apollo 11, but Apollo 11. Uh, was itself about something. The moon landing, the, the, the Apollo flights were themselves about Apollo. The, the moon mission was the culmination, our most potent symbol. Maybe the most potent one we'll have here at the end of the world. I can start drawing up the score a little bit. And um, uh, it's the, this culmination of the Apollonian dream, the rationalist, not nature hating, but maybe nature escaping uh, trajectory. The Shining isn't just about yeah. prophecy. The Shining isn't just a prophetic document. The Shining is the god of prophecy. The Shining is the splendor of an appearing Apollo, this most ideal of gods. What would, what would Apollo look like? Well, if you're casting Star Trek in 1970, he's a tall, handsome Hollywood actor who by <laughs> filming technique is made to look 15 feet tall. <laughs> The Enterprise crew six feet. Um, but uh, Apollo the god, this, especially this most ideal of gods, this god of symbolic culture, of reason, god, Apollo's body just is a coherent arrangement of his own symbols. That's what the god's body would be. And that's what the film is. The film could be seen as a coherent arrangement of Apollonian symbols. So why not say the film is the god? The film is Apollo. Or at least the film is the means by which the God is appearing. That's how, that's how a revelation would happen. <coughs> Shining is about all of these things and many more. And all of these things, these are the four covered in the documentary room 237. All of these things connect to the animals. So the Holocaust means total sacrifice of the animals. The full burning at the Temple of Jerusalem. And what is the Minotaur? Well, the Minotaur is a Pandian monster of our own making. Hurting capitalism in its core etymological sense begins with the penning in the bull. We keep him from the herd he generated 
and would protect. We're cowards. The herding doesn't happen without killing all the bulls and castrating those that would become bulls and would protect the herd. And we keep one just for a sperm, <coughs> just for a sperm or just for mocking rituals in which we lord it over him in very unfair matches. They never let the bull fight twice in bullfighting because he learns. It's especially dangerous the second time. We mock him, and, and not just that, but we, we, we give it an aura of mutual respect so that we're actually uh, sort of parasitic-like, siphoning his, his moral integrity, his strength. The bull is... This lone bull and the minotaur stand for all the absent ones we've killed and castrated out of existence. The bull is both analog and enemy, inversion of the patriarch who assumes cruel rulership of the herd. Minotaur is some raging fusion of human patriarch and the animal patriarch he supplants. The king of the herd hides within this epistemic maze, dons the mask and the aura of the animal. And when the monster's finally met in the cool light of morning, we see he's really our father gone mad. He's some kind of, uh, here he, he's wearing plaid, all plaid, corduroy, he's some kind of insane, he's <laughs> kind of insane farmer. Farmer father gone mad, acting like a bull. All right. Well, uh, I thought maybe I'd save some of the books for, for next time. For, for, there's going to be a next term to Animal Rights Academy in the fall. Um, we'll talk about some literature. But I'll give you a little preview of what I've been thinking about for some of these works. Um, we'll talk about The Last Temptation. Uh, and we'll use that as a window into, you know, more, I mean, the core narrative, the story of um, the Messiah. It's, you know, to tip my hand a little bit, well, this is not my analysis, but, I mean, the, uh, the, the arc of the story, of the Jesus story, right? He begins in a manger. What is a manger? It's some kind of portal from the animal world to the human world. It's where the, you know, it's, it's a doorway between the animal world and the human world, and he's born into that. And the animals are the first to recognize him. There's a gentle sniff and nuzzle kind of recognition ritual well before the wise men arrive. And, well, if you want to be cynical and, and be really animalist about what's going on, the wise men arrive and co-opt this being who's arrived to help the animals. And co-opt him with the fruits of capital, right? They're lucrative items into, into helping humans. Who, who has he come to save? This is a question that comes up weirdly in the Cousin Zacchaeus. Who is he here to save? I'm not sure Cousin Zacchaeus was, was conscious of it, but... He keep, Jesus keeps asking that, and it's like, literally, corpses of animals appear before him. When he's going into the desert in the temptation sequence, um, he, he kind of yells at God. He says, I'm coming here to the desert because I'm sick of signs and portents and uh, mixed messages and deferrals and symbols. I want you just to give me the unalloyed truth. And a paragraph later, he comes upon the bloated split corpse of the sacrificial goat who's been herded, stoned from village to village to bear all the sins of the humans. This is his son. He recognizes this is his son. He's just asked for the, the, the pure truth of what his mission is. And of course, the reader says, oh, goat, symbol for what's about to happen to him. Your mission, Jesus, is yeah, to yeah. die yourself and become the son. Of course, that's part of what's going on. But maybe this is his literal answer. Here, you want a mission? Look at what they did to this innocent being. And Jesus even says, speaks to the dead goat. He says, you, like all animals, were pure and innocent. And man, the coward, murdered you. But he doesn't recognize that maybe this is his mission to help the animals. But at the end of his life, maybe inquitly, a little bit confusedly, he comes to a realization. He's killed for charging the slaughterhouse. Attacking the slaughterhouse. Right? This is the straw that breaks the back of the local powers that be. And the local powers that be, the, the temple priests that are there at the pleasure of the Romans, probably. Jesus attacks the mafia-run slaughterhouse. Mafia in the sense of um, organized crime. I mean, every, every slaughterhouse is organized crime. But this is one controlled by the Roman Empire. <coughs> organized crime on, a, on an empiric scale. So that, that arc is there in the core story, in Kazantzakis. <coughs> if you go with that hypothesis... That, not that Jesus came to rescue the animals from humans, though in 
part that's it. But he's a universal savior, which includes all species. And the mission mistranslated, right? In, in, in theory of messiahship, you know, when you ask about the missing years, for me, the most plausible interpretation of what's going on is there's some kind of epistemic fog, and he doesn't know from birth who he is. He's got to figure it out, and it's difficult. He's been inserted among the humans, and he's got to figure out what his mission is. This is, this is like Moses, who's born among the ruling classes, and could very easily have lived among them and interpreted his mission on earth to rule with the Egyptian highest of the high. But he sees, what is it? He sees a Jewish slave being whipped or beaten by an Egyptian, and something snaps like Nietzsche at the end of his life. And the <laughs> horse, or the horse, donkey, yes. yeah. And then he comes, then he comes to his, no, my mission is not, I was born, of, uh, he thought he was born among the, the royalty. My mission is to be an insider among the royalty, and then to identify with the oppressed. Maybe there's an analogous structure in, in Jesus' mission. But he didn't get it until the end, and he tragically is executed for it. He doesn't lead a successful revolt. Anyway, we'll look at the, if you go with this theory, the Kazanzakis becomes interesting. It seems to support it. I don't think intentionally by Kazanzakis, but it's littered with this kind of um, evidence. Uh, we'll talk about mating by Norman Rush. Um, this, this is a book that you could change the M to an E and call it eating. It's a book <laughs> obsessed with food. Its protagonist is a nutritional anthropologist trying to finish her doctoral research in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. She's gone to, to study the original eating patterns of the Bushmans. What is it that humans, <coughs> the earth human, ate originally? This is the, the core question of her research. And the whole book's like her research trip. It's, it's a depiction of a new Eden, and the question of what Eden will eat becomes key by the end of the book, and it, it splits into, into a debate between whether the slaughtered wildebeest will flow through yearly through Eden or not. Will Eden's, the new Eden's economy integrate with the old African one? And we'll talk about American pastoral. Um, There's a father-daughter battle at the heart of this, a relationship at least, an antagonism. Daughter initiated, perhaps, and uh, the father is a second-generation animal worker. He comes from the tanneries and loveries of Newark. He's, he trades in animal skins, and his daughter rebels and identifies with that countercultural spirit of the 60s and ends up Jane. So this, I mean, this is a book which, which on its surface, um, on its surface as a battle between the old world cow killers, leather workers, and a daughter who's furious and uh, rejects that wholesale. I'm, I'm not sure Roth is, is consciously, it's more interesting that Roth isn't consciously, he's just, he's a good writer, he's tapped into something, and, and, and so this theme which is key to understanding America and the human situation emerges pretty naturally, I think. But that's, you know, that's the next term at Academy.